Those of you that were here a couple weeks ago will remember this map where Joshua, who was to be with God as Moses, his mentor, his predecessor was, and was to lead the children of Israel, the second generation across the Jordan, into taking the promised land. The name Joshua in the Greek is Jesus, Jesus, he who saves. We saw in that message previously that Joshua in chapter 5 had, in this book, had an encounter with the real Jesus. It was a Christophany. He saw an apparition of Jesus with a sword in his hand, and he was telling him, I'm the Lord, I'm the commander of the Lord's armies. And Joshua asked him, are you for us or against us? And he says, neither. But as commander of the Lord's army, I have come. We need to let go of our own expectations in our flesh, our own inbuilt projections of what the future should look like based on what we interpret the scripture to mean and let God decide how to take this land and what he wants to do in this land. Ooh, can I get some more agreement with that? Woo! <laughs> I intentionally left out a detail because I knew that God would bring it up, and he did. And he wants to release it this weekend. Again in the fifth chapter of Joshua. So it was when all the kings of the promised land, the seven nations, the leaders of the Canaan land nations, when they heard the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted. God lifted up, it says in, in the scripture, in many interpretations, he heaped up the waters of the Jordan to one side and they crossed over on dry land. Word got out what God was doing and the heart of the enemy melted. Oh yeah. And there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. They had no spirit to fight because it was so evident that God was moving. I want to take a pause in the text right there. And I want to remind us, when we ask God, is he for us or for someone else? His answer is neither. I am for my will to be done here on earth. <clears throat> When we pray, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That word will comes from the Greek word philema, which means good pleasure. Your kingdom come, your good pleasure be done on earth as it is in heaven, not my own. So when the children of Israel are right there on the cusp of taking the city of Jericho, they understand that the enemy has lost heart. They don't want to fight anymore. This would be a perfect time and my own expectation of what God wants me to do to go in and take the land. Their knees are trembling. Did I do that good? <laughs> Their hearts are gone. They're melted. Their spirit for fighting, their passion for fighting is gone. This would be a perfect time, but God has a different plan. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel. Some of these people were 40 years old. On behalf of all the brothers. Ouch. <clears throat> Not all of them were infants. They had something going for them that the first generation did not. The first generation was circumcised in the flesh, but they had no heart to go in and follow the Lord and do everything he wanted them to do. 
the second generation was not yet circumcised in the flesh, but in their hearts they wanted to do whatever God wanted them to do. It's something called consecration. We've heard the term. It comes from the Latin word consecrare, which means to make sacred. In their hearts, that second generation, under the leadership of Joshua, they were consecrated. They had a sacred relationship, a sacred devotion and dedication to God that the first generation did not. Amen, Brother Jim. Is that us? Are we consecrated to him? I want to posit in our hearts and I say our because I'm including myself, that we are all being consecrated. It's a process. We were circumcised, but the only one that can circumcise our hearts, Jesus. In him, you were also circumcised by the circumcision, which can only be done by Christ, Colossians 2.11. He took that body of sin and perfectly excised it with his sword of the spirit. He is the word of God. That word of God that penetrates and divides soul and spirit perfectly excised that sin off our hearts. Made us clean and whole. As Pastor Paul says, the rest of us is just trying to catch up. That's called consecration. Those times when we're in the Lord's presence and he reminds us of how sacred we are to him and how sacred he should be to us. There's a lot of definitions of consecration that have to do with sacrifice and cleansing and dedication. Those are all true. I'm going to suggest this definition based on some good digging on my own, but some time in the presence of the Lord. I want to suggest to you that consecration is receiving in my heart my identity as sacred to God. And therefore, living life as sacred to God. It's him who comes in and circumcises my heart, makes me brand new. And I know for sure that I am not the same person anymore. He makes all things new. He loves me first, therefore I can love him. Without his first circumcision, without his first intervention in my heart and making me new, I cannot love him the way I'm supposed to. True consecration is receiving my identity in him, made clean, made whole, made sacred, and then holding that sacred in in, in my conscious awareness, holding that sacredness in my heart. It gets better. The world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man That's a quote that originated from an evangelist in Great Britain, but was made famous by D.L. Moody, who had problems. This this is a man, D.L. Moody, Dwight Lyman Moody, founded Moody Bible Institute, which my grandfather attended. This is a man that at the age of 17 was on fire for God, but was too nervous to talk to adults. He preferred instead to talk to teenagers in Sunday school. But God, because he was doing a consecration work in his heart, God began to draw him into his fears. And over a hundred million people heard him preach the, the word of God in the United States and in Europe, leading hundreds of thousands to the Lord. The world has yet to see what one man consecrated to him can do. By God's grace, I aim to be that man. What if we were to transpose that word me or that word man with us? Would you say this with me? The world has yet to see what God can do with a church fully consecrated to him. By God's help, we aim to be that church. Let that be an in-birth persuasion in Jesus' name. This is not just ACF. This is every house. It's one church. (laughs) It's one church that loves Jesus. And we don't get 
caught up anymore in the name of Jesus in those piddly denominational differences. I love that we have Presbyterians in our midst. We have Episcopals in our midst, Baptists in our midst, and even some Catholics in our midst. I say even. I don't mean it in any slight. As a matter of fact, I've come to honor Catholics more in so many ways because you can look, you can look at their tenets of faith and their creeds and you can say, oh, that's what they're led by. But this is a religion that has not backed down in the truth of Jesus Christ. Where so many of the evangelical community has watered down the gospel and the truth that you need to come to Jesus through repentance, the Catholic Church hasn't. And if we look at the hypocrites in one denomination, we need to be looking in our own independent denomination and see what's going on in our own house. Lest we look at a speck in someone else's eye and then overlook the plank in our own. If someone loves Jesus with all their heart, soul, and mind and loves their neighbor as their self, those are the only two commandments God gave us. Some of my doctrine, some of my theologies, that's not the anchor point. Any of that can be wrong. But the in-birth persuasion, the sacredness of those encounters with God, what he's done in my heart, I can truly say I love him with all I know how to love him, with all my heart. And I hope you can too. And I love you. I love you as myself because of him. That's true Christianity. I said before, it's birthed in love. It's birthed in the heart. Old and New Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was after the heart in the Old Testament, before the coming of Christ. He's after the heart today, after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. The problem was, because the hearts weren't circumcised, because they weren't consecrated, they kept wanting to go back to Egypt. So many times we get set free from addiction. Set free from depression. Set free from a physical illness. Set free from guilt, shame, and condemnation. And then a day later, or a week later, or a short time later, the enemy wants to come back and just start sowing it again. Stirring that up. Those thoughts that are not from him. It's akin to the children of Israel wanting to go back to Egypt. He's saying to us, will you believe that I have circumcised your heart? Will you believe I have prepared your heart to receive my faith? Will you believe I've prepared your heart to receive my truth, my love that never fails? A circumcised heart receives that. And consecration follows. Romans 2, Paul, circumcision is not that which is outward in the flesh. It's that of the heart in the spirit. I recently had an encounter with the Lord a few weeks ago, and I was just incredibly undone, beyond the point of embarrassment. My boys were walking out as I was just heaving. I mean deep heaves. God was doing something deep in me. It was like the groans that come. Oh! It, was, it, was a, it was a deep pulling and a wrenching in my inner core what God was doing. And he was relieving me and releasing me and setting me free as I repented, as I consecrated, as I called what he wants to do sacred no matter what. And what I want to do is his. As I entered into that consecration encounter with him, he was releasing me from shame. What do you have to be ashamed about, Josh? What do you have to be ashamed about? <clears throat> It was a shame, deep, 
deeply embedded in my heart. And that's why it had to be pulled out by the grace and the mercy of the Holy Spirit. It was a deeply embedded shame that I was not doing enough for God. <clears throat> we cannot earn our place in heaven. I cannot earn more love from God. It's already there. I cannot earn my righteous standing with him. But I can seek him with all my heart. And there were certain places that I was not seeking him with all my heart. Or I had consecrated myself to something less than him. And so I let it go, and it just starts coming out. My son, Danny, walks out. He's like, whoa. Because it's just, it's just a, it's a continual flow of tongues. I am gushing rain out of my eyes. And just those groans that come when you're in his presence and he's healing the deep, the depths. It doesn't have to be groaning, but oftentimes it is when he goes in deep. It's his deep calling unto our deep. And so I let it go, and a beautiful thing happened. I'll tell you what, this is one of the areas that he was dealing with, with not giving him my all, was it was a spirit of mammon. You cannot serve two masters. You either love the one and hate the other, or be loyal to the only one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so, <laughs> I've preached this, where, <laughs> God, all of my money, all of my earthly possessions are yours. But he was showing me, what about that money you set aside for retirement? What about that IRA? And so I was like, whoa. I didn't see that. I thought I had given that to you. Oh, <laughs> it's coming out. It is coming out. And so my wife and I are praying about some things that God wants to do with that. He tells us not to store up treasures in heaven where earth and moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. What is an IRA? <laughs> It's not a treasure in heaven unless it's consecrated to him. Oh, there you go. Oh, God. <laughs> a beautiful thing happened. I've never seen this before. In that moment, in that encounter with Jesus, I got a Christophany. I saw a picture of Jesus when he was in his incarnate state, ministering the three years that he was on the earth, three or more. He's ministering, and I looked, I saw him, and I've never seen this before, how easy it was to be and do what he was doing. I've always thought it was hard. <laughs> but when my heart is consecrated to him, the things that once seemed hard, I now, in the sacred relationship with him, I give to him. And there's a depth of intimacy. No more spirit of mammon. No more self-protection. No more guardedness or enclosing. Nothing else in between me and him. I give it to him. And in that state of intimacy, just like Jeremiah promises, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jeremiah says, and you will seek me and Find me when you search for me with all your heart. It was so easy to flow. All it was, as simple as this, every day I wake up, Jesus, what do you want to do? My agenda is yours. The only thing that makes it hard is when I take my agenda and I make it mine. And those little pricks of the Holy Spirit, how he speaks and how he moves, how he impresses on our hearts, moves on our hearts to follow that still small voice. And sometimes it's a thunder because it takes a thunder. He speaks and I follow. He leads and I follow. Does that make sense? The Lord said to Joshua, the day I, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day. That's the very spot that he circumcised all of the sons of Israel. And in that obedience, 
It wasn't just a matter of ritual. It wasn't just a matter of physical action. It was their heart saying, even at the age of 40 years old, I am submitting to God. Whatever you say, however embarrassing, however hard it is, however difficult it is, I, it, it doesn't even make sense. I am going to follow God and do what he wants. To obey is better than sacrifice, amen? To heed than, the, than, than sacrifice, to heed the word of God. And so that reproach and that disgrace, the shame of not being consecrated to God was removed. I had a Gilgal experience <laughs> a few weeks ago. I've, had, I've probably had three really significant consecration moments in the last three or four years. I just share that because I want to stir faith. The testimony of what Jesus de- does is the spirit of prophecy. Receive that prophetic word. He wants to be in those moments with you where you consecrate your heart. Uh, I just want to show you a few quotes. The best means of resisting the devil is to destroy whatever the world remain whatever the world remains in us to, in order to raise to raise for God upon its ruins the ruin of the world being destroyed a building of love then shall we begin in this fleeting life to love God as we shall love him in eternity John Wesley 250,000 miles on horseback around England preaching the gospel 40,000 sermons consecrated to God living faith is above circumstances no delays can discourage it no loss friends or depression and trade can touch it Reese Howells there's so much that can be said about these great men of faith I'm going to tell you what these are just ordinary men like you and me and women that just said yes to God (laughs) Reese Howells meets the Lord late in life compared to his siblings. Young adult. He meets a woman named Lizzie, Elizabeth Hannah, later Howells. He marries her. They have their only child, Samuel, which turns out to be prophetic. Prophetic. Because when he's three years old, the Lord calls Reese and Lizzie, husband and wife, to Africa, and it's no place to take a child. And just like Samuel in the, in the Bible was dedicated by Hannah to the things of God, consecrated to the things of God, Reese and Lizzie, in their consecration to God, consecrate Samuel to God. They have to leave him. They leave him with his uncle, who he who Samuel comes to recognize as dad. Five years, only child, they're doing the work of the Lord. Revival breaks out. They end up coming back. Samuel spends weekends with his uncle, who he's called dad and his aunt, and spends weeks with Reese and Lizzie, his biological parents. I'm sharing this with you because we need to, when we're talking about consecration, it's everything. It's everything. Even our children. (laughs) That's why we dedicate them to God. Samuel becomes, uh, follows in his father's footsteps and takes over the Bible school he starts. A true revival means nothing less than a revolution, casting out the spirit of worldliness and selfishness and making God and his love triumph in the heart and life. Andrew Murray, revivalist in South Africa. The way that revival started was through consecration. It wasn't just the great oratory skills of Andrew Murray or his prolific writing. A 15-year-old girl, South African girl, gets up in the service and says, Pastor, can I pray? And he reluctantly says yes. He doesn't want to let her do it. She prays and the Holy Spirit breaks out in the meeting. He's trying to contain it because it's too chaotic. He tries for some time to contain it. And then God meets him. 
And he has to consecrate himself to God. What you say, God, is sacred. My expectations on how a meeting should flow based on my education, I surrender to you. And God moved in a mighty way. A man by his sin may waste himself, which is to waste that which on earth is most like God. This is man's greatest tragedy and God's greatest grief. A.W. Tozer, insecure by his lack of education, God used as a prolific author, took a church of a handful of people in Chicago and it became hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. God used him mightily. Or how about this one? David Wilkerson. Many of those who once were so passionately in love with Christ now run about pursuing their own interests. They're burdened down with stress and problems, chasing after riches and the things of the world. Let that be an in-birth persuasion for all of us. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. We wonder why we're so frustrated because we're so caught up in our riches and chasing after. It would do us well to just dump our bank accounts. I mean, even if, even if you're wondering if God's telling you to do that, why not? <laughs> What's it hurt? What are you going to spend it on? <laughs> Spirit of mammon, whoo! <laughs> it's gone! Uh, it'll come back and try to get in, but we keep letting it go. David Wilkerson, his thing, and one of his things, God, I'm going to give you these two hours every night that I give to television. I'm going to give them to you in prayer. And out of that exchange was birthed the Times Square Church. <laughs> Just two hours a day. That's it. It was a church that was birthed where there were X-rated movies and X-rated things going on, prostitution, drugs, and all this. And <laughs> He's going to give you those two hours consecration. If Jesus had preached the same message that ministers preach today, he would never have been crucified. <clears throat> Why do we expect to be better treated in this world than Jesus was? <clears throat> Leonard Ravenhill, lambasted, slandered in the press, because he would not water down the gospel. He started as a teenage boy. And just like those good kings, the handful of good kings in the Old Testament that were good at the beginning and good at the start, he ran his whole life and he continued from the street ministry that he started, proclaiming the truth of God. He continued that until the day he died. He's known for, because of his consecrated life to Christ, he's known for people that gave their lives to Jesus and it continued. They didn't just give their lives to Jesus in an emotional state. They gave their lives to Jesus in the preaching of the true gospel. Don't waste your time consuming what makes you weak. Spend your time pressing in for the presence. Become so intimate with Jesus, so full of him, that it does not matter what challenges in life present themselves to you. Heidi Baker. When I was in Brazil, Randy shared a little personal story about Heidi. He is Randy Clark. Um, he was very, he, God used him to facilitate the Toronto outpouring. Heidi Baker was there. And in a moment of inspiration, Randy asked Heidi, do you want the nation of Mozambique? She said yes. But she didn't just say yes. She said, yes! I want the nation of Mozambique. It's yours. It's yours. And she's at this a powerful encounter with the Lord. But within the next year to two years, her husband gets diagnosed with cerebral malaria. She gets diagnosed with uh, MS. She loses 90% of her funding and the orphanages that they were planning on using to help the ministry of Iris start. Everything is falling apart. But because of that moment she had in Toronto where she's consecrated herself to the Lord, she sticks through. She perseveres, her and Roland both. They're both healed. God raises up funds in another way. As their ministry proceeds, she's held at gunpoint 
I think it was three times by Muslim fanatics. She's had lots of death threats. God delivers her through those things because she's got a, she's with the Lord. <laughs> what you say is sacred, Father. What you want from me is sacred. I don't care what else happens. I believe it's four or five states now in Mozambique that are now Christian. The government has removed the Muslim dedication of those states, and now they're Christian states. This is a woman of God that was just like you and me. She just consecrated herself. The circumcised heart that you've created, Jesus, only made possible by you. I give myself to you. You've made it possible in this newness. I now call you sacred, and you call me sacred. I'm stepping into that identity as consecrated to you. Let me show you one more. Leif Hetland. I live life by the principle that I am a little boy and a big papa. We can live with a big papa. We can live from one of two perspectives. Big problems, little papa, or big papa, little problems. <laughs> <laughs> This is a guy, his consecration looks something, something special. He was a burnt out Baptist minister with a small congregation addicted to painkillers. God met him in every single Muslim nation that you can think of, he is in. He's led over a conservative number a million people, a million Muslims to the Lord by saying yes to Jesus. If you would, just stand to your feet. I want you to say this with me. This is Paul's letter to the Philippians and to us because it's in Scripture. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. There's a word that I released last night and I feel to release it this morning. Those of us that have dealt with witchcraft and occultic type practices in the past. The Lord is just saying the reason you picked that up was because it was deep painful. It was deep pain in your heart, very painful in your heart. And in an act of trying to control the situation and in a desperate attempt to control the divine, that which cannot be controlled, you reached out and you started dabbling in the occult. He wants to consecrate you to himself. He is here in mercy. He is here in love. He sees your pain. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you in person. I won't ask you to raise your hand in front of everybody, although that does happen, <laughs> and we allow it to happen. It's just, if the Lord sets you free, let it go in Jesus' name. Those of us, this is, this is another one, those of us that have a propensity towards alcohol, I don't get drunk because the word doesn't say to get drunk, and I don't get drunk. But the Lord is saying, I want you to consecrate yourself to me. Instead of seeing what you can get away with or how much you can do outside of my will and the purity and the sacredness of my relationship with you, let it go. He's calling you to. He's speaking, he's speaking to sexual immorality the, the times that we've, um, we've sought comfort in human ways. And let me be very clear about sexual immorality. Anything that's outside of the way God defines marriage between a man and a woman as he's created them in marriage to have sexual relations. Anything outside of that, premarital sex, extramarital affairs, same-sex relationships, all of it. He is here in a loving and merciful capacity. When he encounters us, we're undone in his presence. Some of us are looking at stuff online that we should not be looking at. And I'm not just talking about pornography, although that's included. 
those of us that are addicted to shopping, those of us that have Netflix accounts, I feel, I feel the Holy Spirit in a, in a pure way just saying, give me three months. Why don't you stop your Netflix account for three months and give me that time for three months? It's, 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 it's so little. But sometimes we need to press into that. We need to press into that. Seek him with all our heart. And he meets us. It's, instead of shopping because it makes me feel good, and we're honest, we know that that's what we're doing, a lot of us, if the shoe fits, I've been there. I'm going to give you this time. What do you want to do with this time right now? I feel I'm challenging some of us to go on a fast. All of us need to fast. Jesus doesn't say if you fast. He says when you fast. To some of us to ch- fast an entire day and give him just that one day and say, Father, I'm consecrating, intentionally consecrating everything I know how to do. I'm consecrating this, this day to you. The reason you would even come to that decision is because he's putting it in your heart. I'm not talking about something you're doing in your own will, although your will does have to comply with what he wants to do i'm giving you this day so whoever you want me to speak to whatever word of knowledge you want me to step out in faith and deliver to someone i don't know however you want me to reach out to the neighbor across the street or next door i'm fasting and i'm going to let you do that through me it's a big deal when we step into our identities as sons and daughters of God and stop living a duplicitous life where we've got one foot in the world and one foot in the heavenly realm. And un, and it, it, James says it, and a double-minded man, a duplicitous man or woman is unstable in all their ways. And we wonder why we get tossed to and fro so much. Because God has hardwired us. He doesn't make us do it, but he's hardwires us. He's created us to say yes to him and to choose him, to be consecrated to him. Some of us are being stirred to ask for forgiveness and say, I'm sorry, without expecting a sorry back. And it's very, very hard because I'm going to tell you right now as the Holy Spirit leads me, you were wronged. You should not have been treated that way. But now the greater wrong is that you're not consecrating that situation. You're not letting the sacredness of God come into that and let him guide the situation. Let him be the Lord of it. He is saying to you, forgive and you will be forgiven. There is life for you in the forgiveness. There is life for you in saying, I'm sorry. What else can Josh step on today? <laughs> uh, yeah. He's so good. God is good. All the time. <laughs> Praise God. The word agenda is coming to mind. I have my agenda for the day, for the season, for the future. And the Lord would even say, I have my agenda for the past. This is what's happened in the past and this set of rules, regulations, and interpretation that I have set up. This is the way it should be. It's an agenda that needs to go. The Lord is putting his finger on agenda. The simplicity of the way he wants us to live in the moment, each and every day, whatever you want, God, that's what we want. We lay our agendas at you, before you, consecrated before you. We say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, your good pleasure be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us right now our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but
but deliver us from the evil one. We know you will. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen.